Okay, good day. Today is February 21st, 2023. Who are you? I'm Brandon Wagner. I work for Institutional Risk and Safety at UTD. And I am Roger Molina, co-director of the Sci Lab at UT Dallas. So we thought we would try and talk about things uh, because we're preparing for the 10th anniversary of this particular research lab on the campus. So what would we like to tell our listeners? Um, so the two things that I've thought about, um, the main one that I like the idea of is talking about how to get everybody who uh, has different disciplines, different experiences, different levels of hands-on time with their discipline. How do we get everybody together to cooperate and be productive and create? Okay, so I, I'm going to do a digression. So a colleague of mine, Sarah, um, Sarah Beth Book, uh, Mary Beth Book, Sorry, I wrote a book called Not In My Title, and she complains that everybody tried to pigeonhole you into one professional discipline. Um, whereas she said in today's work market, you need to change jobs every 10 years. So maybe you're a brain scientist for 10 years, and then you become a firefighter. So I, I very much agree with you that universities tend to funnel people down into individual ways of thinking, disciplines. But what is your idea? Um, well, my idea has a lot to do with that different people uh, always have something to add to a conversation. Um, even if you go into a conversation with somebody and you come out of it thinking like, I, I don't want to think that way, I don't want to, I don't want to go down that road. Um, we always can value what the other person next to us has to say and the experience they give. And so I really like a, a way to take somebody who even off the street, right, you gave an idea once of science, uh, kind of like science grocery stores where you have a grocery store in every mm -hmm. neighborhood, you would have a, a science repository where you could go and engage. Well, I want universities to be more like that for the common person. Uh, you know, not to separate education out. Yeah, you know, I'm doing it right there. I'm separating education out. From okay, so uh, so let me just out. divert this into something that we've been chatting about. So you're in a health and safety position yes, uh, right now. So if the phone rings, you have to pick it up mm -hmm. and go run and save someone's life or recover some spilled uh, pollutants. Um, we're sitting in my office in the uh, Ethan O'Donnell building at the moment. What health and safety issues do you notice around us? Uh, there's some stuff that's stacked up high that, you know, could fall on you. Uh, a little bit of haphazard play. There's some trip hazards. It's a little, it's a little cramped in here. Um, I'd have to know when the building was built, because there's always the chance there's asbestos in the walls. We have certain buildings on campus that were built in the era of asbestos insulation. And so depending on if you want to put that thumbtack or you want to drill a, a screw into the wall, the dust you, you put out could very okay, well. Okay, so um, I guess what immediately comes to mind is in my case, um, I have a cognitive disorder. I'm phototropic. I hate being in, in a closed room in the dark. Hmm. And so when they assigned me this office, I said, can't I have an office with a window? They said, no. And, it, you know, just like we just went for a walk in the sunshine, I think differently in light and differently in dark. Um, let me just point out another health and safety issue to you that you didn't sure. happen to mention. Um, so there's an electric switch here that I'm going to turn on, and I'm sure it has not been checked by health and security. And it's an artwork made by a colleague of mine in Houston. Uh, his name is Yaroslav Yelik. So if we die from his artwork, we, we can sue him. Nice. Um, well, no, artists are not responsible for people dying when they experience artwork. If you have a heart attack in a horror film, you cannot sue the filmmaker. I'm sorry. Uh, artists and everyday people have different rules. Um, so yeah, there's electricity flowing through that thing, um, it has no label on it, no instructions. Um, I'm the only person who knows what it is and what it's for. So is that a health and safety risk? Um, strictly speaking, yes, but I think a lot of people understand that safety is in some ways a personal choice. So we can recommend 
in a, in a research lab environment that you wear the heaviest possible personal protective equipment to um, you know protect you from what you work with. Uh, but we don't uh, we don't we don't hammer that in. Everybody has to decide how they're going to interact with the their environment. We have minimums we think that everybody should follow, but uh, okay, gotcha. It's now, subjective. one one of the things we've complained with, and my supervisor is not listening to us right now, okay. was that some of your work is just very routine, mm -hmm. and there's no creativity involved. Mm -hmm. Can you give any examples of creativity that you've used in health and safety? Um, so a couple examples. Um, I had to map out a dock for uh, the map out a, a dock, so a dock. receiving area yeah. for a shipment to um, accommodate compressed gas cylinders. So the labs will use these big metal cylinders for all kinds of different things. And I had to map that out to plan how we were gonna efficiently store these. Uh, other creative outlets. Um, I think the only other one I can think of is just the conversations I have with people. I, I, I think of things I've Okay, really that's it, let me you, right? So when we were talking earlier, you referred to conversations as creative opportunities. Mm -hmm. I forget exactly how you phrased it. And I think you're right. Um, we now live in a world where people walk around with earbuds in their ears and never talk to people they meet on the street or at the supermarket or the gym mm -hmm. or here on campus. Uh, and yes, um, one, of the, one of my colleagues at the Center for Brain Health is Bonnie Pittman, you probably know her name. But she started this website called Do Something New. Mm -hmm. And she did that when she became severely ill and she had to stay home in bed and she was bored and anxious. And she came up with this practice of doing something new. And one of the things she said, well, why don't, when you're lining up for food at a supermarket, why don't you start talking to the person in line? And suddenly you discover that it's the most amazing person you ever met. You had no idea that they were coming to the same supermarket as you, and it gave you hope. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, sometimes if you're too talkative, people think you're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's me. Um, but sometimes by thinking aloud, talking to other people. Um, so let me just give you an example. Um, in our graduate seminar last night, um, a very interesting student called Sivas, I think his name is, he told me he'd, he is from Nepal and he'd been a priest for six years. And he made a very critical statement about this university. He said, I'm taking all the courses, but what is the point? Why should I take your course, professor? What's the point? And he kind of got me stuck um, because I think part of the point is, you know, I've been living for 73 years. I have made mistakes you haven't made yet. Uh, I have had successes you haven't made yet. I hate the word mentoring mm -hmm. because I, I really like your idea more of a creative back and forth uh, where you put things in the air and see what the other person thinks. So what would you like to put in the air right now? Um, well, if I had to put anything out there, I mean, it'd probably be, uh, the environmentalism that I've been involved in. We had somebody come talk recently about some mud paintings they do, and that they go to super fun sites and collect mud to make artwork with it. And I've, I've been mentally kind of, uh, captured by env environmentalism lately. Um, and honestly, I want to be able to talk to more people from every single walk of life because there's nobody that doesn't interact with their environment and doesn't have a stake in this. Okay, so we just stumbled on, I think it's a very good point. Her name is Jenny Whiteman that makes mud paintings, uh, which then change color with time depending on the pollutants and the microbes that are living in the mud. Um, but there were all kinds of other resources around us on this campus. I wonder how we could express our anxiety about climate change by making art using materials from the local environment. I've been thinking about that, and it's not just climate change to be totally accurate. You could you could leave climate change completely out of it and still just see the 
impact. Yeah, the impact. You don't even have to get into the long term. I mean, it's, it's right now. It's happening right now. Uh, the mercury are in the fish right now, not 100 years from now. All these issues are, are okay. staring us in the so face. So one of the things that happened is I put uh, Jenny Whiteman in touch with Robert Stern, who's in the geology department. Mm. We might want to pick up this discussion with him. Um, like and he said, okay, in the evolution of life, geology had a huge role. Mm -hmm. They watch elements were in the rocks. But also plate tectonics created very slow change that provoked new forms of life to emerge. Because you're, if the Earth had been too stable, everybody would just settle down and we'd still just be full of dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. But it's only because of geologic change that life had to reorganize itself. Um, so um, how on April 12th could we make something from the local environment? I mean, I need a little bit more time to think about okay, that. Okay, so let, let's just think about that. Um, chew on that for a while. But I think um, Heidi Cooley, who uh, was the person who invited uh, Jenny Whiteman, um, is planning to have her come back again. I don't think on April 12th. But let's check that route around. Okay, so we have a, a few minutes left just to wrap up. Um, what would you like to bring up to finish the conversation? Um, I think if I wanted to bring one thing up, it's uh, that I've gotten more value out of just this kind of exercise we're having. Uh, you know, we talked earlier about why don't you talk to the person at the grocery store? Uh, some of the more, I don't, I don't want to use the word profound because I don't even know what I mean by that, but kind of more profound thoughts I've had have been um, Kind of germinated from conversations I have with somebody who isn't even tangentially connected okay, to I the love, discipline. Okay, I love you stumbling onto the word germination because that's what I feel our research lab is. We mm -hmm. bring in people and they grow in a different way than they would have if they hadn't uh, spent time together in our research lab. And that gets into <coughs> um, Sarah Beth Burke's concept of hybridity of hybrid professionals. But Yes, we don't care what diploma you're getting at this university when you work in the room. That's not the point. No, let's talk about something like we're doing now. Okay, so I'm going to give you the final word. What would you like to end our conversation with? Um, you know, I, I hope that, uh, you know, I, I don't have an extensive educational creative background. I worked in the trades when I was okay. young. That's and called imposter syndrome. Uh, I, I understand. Uh, my point being, though, is that even with that being the case, I love to engage with it, and I think that that is a feeling that is present in pretty much more people than than, than we could imagine. More people who aren't connected to something directly okay, so want to be part of. Okay, so how could our lab engage with the local trades people? Yeah, or or just anybody that you wouldn't normally care to go and engage with. It. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, I think your name is Brendan today. Brandon. <laughs> Brandon, my name is Roger, and I'm now going to figure out how to stop.